The Business of Cleaning, the podcast that brings cleaning industry expertise straight to your ears. Hello, everyone, and welcome to The Business of Cleaning. My name is Haley Morris, and I'm your podcast coordinator and host. Today, I have with me Terrell, and I'm going to let her go ahead and introduce herself. Hi there. I am Terrell Wegg. I am the president and CEO of MSNW Group. We are headquartered in Washington State and service uh, a tri-state area, Washington, Oregon, and Idaho. Oh, you guys have quite a large range, don't you, that you service? We do. Yeah, absolutely. We naturally just organically went into three states. Our clients kept on expanding their business with us. And so it wasn't necessarily something that we thought was going to happen. But when you have good customers, you uh, make business decisions to grow with them. That's, I mean, that's super cool to be in a position where you've built such a relationship that you can do that. So absolutely. Yeah. So how long have you been doing this in particular? So MSNW is my family company. So I have grown up in it my whole life. My parents bought uh, what was then called Management Services Northwest back in 1995. And give my age away a little bit if you do the math, but I was 10 years old at the time and my little sister was just born and this was kind of a side hustle for my parents. They thought it would be a good opportunity to uh, have some extra income come in without having to devote a whole lot of time. And what happened was we just kept growing and so it ended up becoming their main job. And that, that happened pretty quick. It went from being a side hustle in 95 to being both of my parents' full-time job in 96, 97. So uh, I fondly remember going with my parents to our local state farm insurance and my little sister is in the baby carrier and she's sitting in the lobby area and I'm running up and down the hallways with the vacuum cleaner because We were trying to do a a quick clean because one of our janitors wasn't able to show up for the job. So in the business, since I was 10 years old, doing a multitude of different things, really cleaning was the the main thing from 10 to 14 and then started working in the administrative side uh, on school holidays and during the summertime to help my mom out as we were, as we were growing. So it was in the accounting systems and all of that. And then would help my dad out on weekends where needed when we were having some coverage issues. And when I turned 16, I got my own janitorial route. And after school, I would go clean one of the local financial institutions. And my parents, once I started having my own job, my parents decided they didn't, they didn't want to be my boss anymore. So they put a supervisor in charge of me. And so a supervisor pretended like I was a new employee and trained me how to, you know, clean properly and all of that, which I had already known because I had grown up in the business. But the funny thing was I, I started working at this financial institution and my supervisor came to me one day and he said, Hey, you're really good at this. I, I think that you could train other people. And so here's a 16 year old kid who was then promoted to essentially uh, an associate supervisor training other team members and doing inspections. So I very quickly moved up in the company (laughs) and uh, had, yeah, that was kind of my, my high school years. And then I didn't really think that I would work in the company at all coming back in the summers. I thought I would do other things and I did. I, I had some other jobs, but still ended up helping out here and there uh, in the company and uh, going into my senior year of college, we had the opportunity to grow with one of our clients in Washington and got 90 financial institutions down the I-5 corridor, which is the main highway here from where we're located, our headquarters are in Ferndale, Washington, all the way down to Olympia, Washington, which is about a three and a half hour jaunt. Um, So our operations manager we had at the time, it was just, it was a lot because we were just concentrated in our little community for such a long time. And then to all of a sudden have this additional responsibility, 90 new locations with that drive time 
was tough. So I approached my mom and I said, you know, I think I can do this. I think I can do this startup. I feel really confident about it. I'm excited to do it. And I had organized all of the routes. This was before having GPS. So you had to like map it out online uh, and use a map to go <laughs> to all the different locations. Uh, but I remember going and, and training people and meeting them and doing interviews and, you know, the whole process. So it really gave me a, a huge overview of how to run uh, a, a large startup. And it felt like how to run a, a little company. So I did that the summer of my senior year, went back to college. I trained somebody to do my job before I went back to college. I continued to do a customer service side, checking in with that client while I was at college, just over the phone. And so this was 2007 and I had a very serious boyfriend at the time. And so I decided I was going to move back home and I talked to my mom and asked if she thought that there was a position for me long-term in the company that I could come into. And she really was not interested in that at all. Uh, <laughs> she wanted me to get experience outside of our, our company and uh, but she thought about it, and we were at a point where we really needed to hire a human resource person, and we really needed to hire a salesperson, but we couldn't necessarily afford both of those positions. And so she hired me on uh, starting, I graduated early, I graduated in December. So I came on as of January and did a split role of uh, human resources and sales. And my degree in college was business with a concentration in marketing and sociology. And so sales was kind of my, where, where I was fit best, but human resources was something that I got to learn and really dive deep in. And it was awesome. Uh, we grew from January to June and then decided to hire a full-time human resource person. And so then I was able to step out of that role and concentrate entirely on sales. And then the rest is kind of history. I grew in the company. I had many different roles, never thought I was going to actually run this business. I got married. I had kids and thought that being a mom was, I was thought I was going to be a stay-at-home mom, to be quite honest. I was like, okay, I'm done with this whole work deal. But uh, I had five months off for my maternity leave and I had started volunteering 40, 40 hours a week. And my husband was like, maybe you should just go back to work because <laughs> it doesn't seem like you're really into this stay at home lifestyle. And uh, at the time there was just some things happening at the company and my mom had wanted me to come back. And so I came back and uh, was working in sales, had the opportunity to, uh, that we had an opening in the president position because at that time my mom had stepped back and um I approached her and I said, you know, I think I can run the company. I think that I've, I've got what it takes and I would love the opportunity and uh, went through some things with the board and here I am today. So that's kind of the, the history of me in MSNW. It's incredible for one. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, thinking of where I had, a, I had a strange childhood, but thinking of where I was at like 10 to 14 to 16 years old and I like to think that it was a unique and incredible experience, but like the skill set I'm sure you had and that you gained throughout those years are just incredible. Like I can imagine how all those things built you up to be ready for the, to be a president by the time you stepped into that position. So, wow. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's really interesting looking back to see what prepared me for where I am today and definitely got uh, the experience at an early age, but led, which led me to being in this position at an earlier age than what you, you typically would be. And I do feel like my, my oldest son is 11 years old right now. The laws for child labor have changed in Washington state since I was young. And so now you have to be 14 years old to be able to, to work. So I do think it's a disadvantage a little bit for him to not be able to get that experience earlier on because there's definitely capabilities there uh, mm -hmm. that could be utilized. So, yeah, anyway. it it's different than like I've seen um, 
like foster parents and stuff like have all of their kids and foster kids like working for them in their pizza shop um and where it's like a situation where like the kids probably shouldn't be there because like a lot of like the stuff is dangerous but also I mean it doesn't sound it sounds like what you gained was hard work and it's kind of funny to think that you uh you thought you were going to be a stay-at-home mom after working from such a young age (laughs) Um, it was one of those things where I didn't I didn't have a stay-at-home mom and I and I saw my friends with stay-at-home moms and so I thought like oh wow like that's such a nice lifestyle to have to give to your children and in retrospect because my mom worked and she showed me and demonstrated how it was done and how to have balance and all of that it prepared me to be more successful as a working parent than had she not been working all that time uh yeah I don't know I mean it can be done both ways right but it is yeah that that was what I thought that I was gonna do yeah and then you ended up working anyways (laughs) yeah exactly um no I mean you just have to commend you've not only worked hard and developed such an incredible skill set that you have worked your way all the way from the bottom up. You know what it takes to work all of those positions straight up through your company, um, which you never want to miss because then if you lose that or you don't have that coming into a seat like yours, it's going to be very hard to connect with your people and understand um, what it's what actually working on the team is like. Yeah, and that- absolutely. And that's part of our training whenever we bring in leadership positions in our company is we say you're never too good to clean a toilet. And so the expectation is, is that you're learning on the front lines with our team and you're doing the same things that they're doing. Uh, that way they feel supported and it's not somebody coming down and you know telling them what to do, but it's somebody coming alongside of them and working uh, to take care of it for our clients. No, that's a, that's a big thing. And I've seen others express that, but I don't know that I've seen as many live it quite as well. Um, I, you know, as you have, so, which actually is one of the perfect segues into today's topic or this month's topic. And that is talking about employee retention and, um, really like developing and caring for your employees. Um, this is something we talked about when we talked the first time. And I think it's a great topic right now, especially because if you're losing team members like flies, there's just nobody out there applying. So I don't think you can look at too many places in the world and especially in this country right now and be like, oh yeah, they are having no problems hiring. It's a tough market. So when you have valuable employees you want to keep them and you want to show them how much they mean to you, not just now, but at any point in your company's timeline, you want to be able to do that. So, yeah, absolutely. It is a tough market and it doesn't feel like it's going to get better. And that's kind of the conundrum that we're in is where is the workforce and what is stopping them from coming back to work and how how do we adjust appropriately with the lack of labor that's out there? I mean, it's a little mind boggling and I'm not going to say that we're doing it perfect, but we're, we're definitely looking at our team member retainage rates and breaking it down by operations manager and supervisor and trying to figure out what the supervisors who have really low retention rates, what they're doing differently or what dynamics are within those contracts that are keeping people there. And some things that we've noticed are the supervisors, it's all about their boss. It's a hundred percent about who they're, who they're working for. And so if that supervisor is, exemplifying the MSNW will take care of it. We care about you mentality, which is checking in with them, making sure that they have the tools to do the job, making sure they're trained appropriately, giving them the time that they need to feel successful and ensuring that they feel heard when there are obstacles. If that supervisor is executing all of those well, it is, it just, it pays dividends in regards to the retainage. And 
the other side of that is also the pay. And we're just, we're in a different market where minimum wage doesn't exist anymore. It's gone. It's at least in Washington and Oregon. Good luck. You're not hiring anybody for minimum wage. So it's going to your customers and having those really honest conversations as to if, if, we can, if you want us to continue to take care of you and to continue to have the consistent service that we are offering, then we have to pay a very competitive wage to our team members because we can't afford and neither can our client to have them leave us for a 25 cent difference in pay somewhere else. And when McDonald's down the street is hiring people for $16 an hour starting, uh, we have to be hiring that or better in order to get the people and keep them. So it's a conundrum. Uh, we can, I, it's, it's almost caring is definitely one part of making a difference in our team's lives and making sure that they're supported and well-rounded support but it also coincides directly with the wages and benefits that we're supplying with our team as well. And uh, just with this kind of competitive, mar competitive marketplace, you have to have both. It can't just be one or the other anymore. So uh, you can't pay well and expect to keep people either because there's another company that's gonna pay them just as well, but maybe treat them better. And so you have to be the best, if that makes sense. <laughs> yeah, no, and I was gonna say, what you see a lot of times is that a company will adopt one side or the other. They'll really work on like taking care of and engaging their employees and they'll let that wage sit kind of at the bottom of the market and they'll wonder why no one's applying or they'll wonder why they can't get people through the interview process or get them to stay. Um, even though the culture is great, it's a lot of fun to work for that, you know, those type of things are in place. But you're right, if you can't, deliver and compensate compensation all across the board as well. Like you can't meet that need, um, especially with inflation. I feel like we've seen inflation disproportionately rise to wages in the last like 40, 50 years. So people need and want to have comfortable lifestyles. Um, so they will seek out a higher wage, even if they love you. But on the flip side, a wage isn't enough. I know a lot of people, I've seen people on the restaurant side flip over to factories and people in the factories run somewhere else. And sometimes they're running to a lower wage because the culture, like nobody's paid attention to how they're being supervised or making sure there's adequate training or check-ins or things like that. Um, people, you have to have both because they're always going to run from the thing that makes them unhappy. And I feel like those are pretty even on the board, you know, with what you need um, mm -hmm. to kind of be successful. So I would agree, like that well-rounded approach. Um, it, and kind of going back to the conundrum of, there's just like nobody applying to positions, but everybody's leaving jobs right now. Um, so it is a question of where they've gone. I haven't looked at the unemployment rate in a little while, but people are talking about that it had, you know, started to drop quite a, a bit since people were able to go back to work and things had opened back up. But then like, you still can't find anybody. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if everybody, um, if a lot of people are going and starting their own businesses or, going to smaller start startups or how it's working. Um, but even, you know, on the administration side, it, it seems like it's hard to hire, whether you're, you're looking at your front line or you're looking at your back of house, that it's hard to get people into both positions. At least that that's what I've seen in our area. We're up in Ohio. So mm -hmm. I feel like it's a pretty, pretty similar market across the country. Yeah. I mean, it's we're our our biggest struggle is frontline, frontline, and I would say with administrative and managerial positions, it the the good most of the good people aren't necessarily looking for jobs because they're you know they found a place where they're happy and because of the up, you know it's interesting though because I did hear some report about uh, those 
upper management positions because, because of COVID burnout, uh, a lot of them are looking, are going to start looking for other jobs potentially. So I haven't seen that yet, but I've heard that that's something that is supposed to be happening. And COVID burnout is a real thing. It's been just the mandate the continued mandates, having to hold people accountable for things that nobody wants to hold them accountable for. It's exhausting. And now, especially with the vaccine mandates on top of everything else, when we're already having a hard time finding people and then having clients who are requiring it for people to be at their locations, especially in the healthcare field, it just feels a little bit like beating a dead horse because we're, you know, we're already like putting them into certain parameters to get them to perform the job in a certain way by all the training and uh, PPE requirements that we have. But then the added thing of now we have to make sure they've got a vaccine. And it just feels very intrusive to that person holistically. And uh, managers are just fed up with it. They're like, I'm done. This is not my jam. I don't want to have to be somebody's doctor and tell them what to do on top of everything else. So it's, I just, I empathize with business owners and management and administrators who have had to combat this in the last 90 days, because it's just another burden. And it's, it's so hard. It's really, it's not great. <laughs> Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's caring not, for those people, you know, I mean, caring for frontline is one thing, but then caring for your, your management and administrative team is, is another and making sure that they have the balance they need, that they can be restored and come back to work and be able to do their job the way that it needs to be done. And, uh, you know, sometimes it feels like everything is an emergency and you, you're constantly working to get things taken care of. And it's taking that step back to say, no, this can wait till tomorrow. And I, I don't need to work till seven o'clock every night just to get my job done. I can take a step back and, uh, and really have focused attention and that's how I'm going to be best in my job. So, yeah, yeah, it's, it's not easy. It's no matter what your view is, we were just talking about the kids in schools and wearing masks and no one's wearing them. Right. And there's all like, you know, even in an environment where it's stricter and kids are expected to listen to their teachers, it's hard. And in the last like several years, the workplace has relaxed across like industries and where there's less expectation for specific uniforms and everybody to match and work and be exactly the same way. Workplaces have backed off breathing down the neck. And the only times that they really do have certain requirements is when they're necessary. So like having to go and get back in their space and say, especially on something where it does feel that like they kind of just passed it off onto businesses to do. They did. Yeah. <laughs> they just kind of gave us the you short take end. Care of it. We're gonna we want we want this done and now it's your responsibility. Have fun. Yeah. Yeah. My <laughs> my dad's an HR and he came home and he's like they just absolutely said they didn't want to do it and passed it off mm -hmm. um so that it, it it's like you said it feels invasive when workplaces are trying to you know give their team members the benefit of the doubt and the ability to work within like you know for example not having a structure of uniforms I think we see that it used to be everybody had to match and do things a certain way um even if it didn't apply to their job um business was whatever industry was tied with uniformity and that's not the case anymore. So yeah, it gets, it's tense and you're right. Like there's a burnout from every side of having to just deal with one thing after the other. And isn't it over yet? Like, when's it going to be over? When are we going to be back to how things were? Mm -hmm. um, so like, when, when can we have our freedom again? And I think everybody's seen that. I think on top of it, one thing I've noticed um, I've seen friends shift positions and things like that, no matter what, what level they're in, entry level, somewhere in the middle, man, you know, their big thing is they're a lot less tolerant of um, certain management styles or certain ways that companies uh, present themselves. And so there's a huge push for like finding that workplace that fits you better. So uh, I saw a post the other day, for example, that when they weren't remote, their company said, you have to have your cameras on the entire time. 
Oh my and gosh, like, I saw that too. Yeah. Oh That's my like, word, how intrusive. Yeah. I was like, listen, I would have picked any other job in the world and I would have been out of there. I don't care. Like, I know I would have, I don't know, I would have got a stimmy or something. I wouldn't have been able to do it. I wouldn't have. <laughs> um, but then they came back and eventually they found another job because like, uh, what you don't realize sometimes, because you've just done it so long, is like how a company manages. You just got used to it. And then over COVID, people realize like really quickly that their tolerance for stuff like that had dropped because there's just too much going on to have to worry mm -hmm. about um, bad managers or stressful situations um, that aren't necessary all the time. Right. So. Right. And I mean, that's just a key point to creating a work environment where people want to stay, right? If you're, if you've ticked all the other boxes off, boxes off that you're competitive with wages, you provide benefits and whatever else, and you're at an even playing level with every other company out there, then it's providing the workplace where the team feels supported and has the resources and tools to do their job successfully and feels like they can accomplish that and go home at the end of the day and have success. So that is something that we were working. I mean, it's not perfect at all. And I think that you're never going to attain perfection. It's always a work in process because this world is constantly changing, but to continually be keeping that at the top of the mind of how can we take care of our team better so they can take care of our clients the way that we're promising we're going to take care of them. So uh, one thing that has not changed in our company, but I do think is really amazing and different, and I would love it if other companies did this too, are we have a, a care fund, actually, that we developed about a decade ago to support our team members who needed a, a hand up. Uh, so what that looks like is we, well, I guess I'll start from the beginning because the reason that we started the care fund is we had a lot of team members, not a lot, but a few team members on the front line where it seemed like a recurring thing where they didn't have enough money to put gas in their car to go service their accounts that they were, they were going to, or uh, somebody's electricity got turned off because they just didn't have enough fund because they had, a, uh, let's just say a, an urgent medical issue that came up that they had to go. The funding that was going to pay for their electrical bill ended up going towards this medical bill over here. So whatever scenario you can think of, that's what was happening. And a lot of these frontline workers don't have the luxury of saving. They're living paycheck to paycheck. And so we were constantly doing things as a company to provide assistance to those people, like giving them a $50 gift card to help here or there, paying the electrical bill, et cetera. And we noticed that our team at the corporate office at the time all wanted to pitch in and help. And so we kind of had a pass the hat going on where people were putting in money to help with X, Y, or Z, maybe it was a medical bill. And so we had a team meeting and we talked about what if we actually had a fund put together for to be able to help our team, like specific fund that was just for our team members. And so that's how we developed the care fund. And what it is now is a team member can put in a certain amount of money into the care fund each pay period. So a lot of times it just ends up being a recurring payment. And a lot of people give a dollar, some people give five. We've had one person in the past who did a hundred dollars per paycheck. Um, pretty crazy, I know. But every dollar that goes in is 100% matched by MSNW. And so then that fund is utilized to care for whomever in our company that has a need arise. And we now have a committee that, uh, that gets these requests and then does the approval process and et cetera. But it's, it's really cool. And we've been able to help numerous individuals and uh, it's empowered our team and it lets them know that it's just not a lip service that we care that we really actually do. And this is something that we put into place to, to show it. So an example that happened in the last year was we had a gal who was escaping a domestic violence situation and she wanted to leave the situation. And so we helped her get a hotel uh, to be able to stay in and 
she was trying to figure out how she could get permanent housing away from her spouse. And she had saved enough money for a, she could pay rent. She was making enough salary that she could pay rent, but she did not have a down payment. And that's where she was falling short. And if she didn't have a down payment, then she was never going to be able to get into permanent housing. So we were able to front her the down payment and get her out of that domestic violence situation and set her up to be successful. And I mean, this is where homelessness comes into play here, right? If we wouldn't have stepped in, her funding would have run out for the hotel, then she wouldn't have even had enough money for uh, the month to month rent. She would have never gotten the, or maybe maybe it would have just taken a lot longer to get that deposit um, funding put together. But uh, she could have been one of these situations where she was on the streets because she didn't have the funding and, and that with women and children specifically, that's a lot of times what happens is that the breadwinner of the family, something happens. And so then these women and children end up being homeless. And so what we're trying to do is stop that cycle. And if we can do it within our team, where there are a lot of frontline workers who are living paycheck to paycheck, that's what we're going to do. And so that's what we're empowering our supervisors and our operations managers to have a relationship with our team. So we know that when these situations arise, that they can come to us and tell us so we can help them. Because if we don't have the relationship, they're not going to feel comfortable coming and asking. And so that's, that's really our mission. And we want to take care of our people. We want to make a difference in this world by taking care of the team that we have. And so you know, it's a little piece, but that's, that's our piece that we're, we're trying to do well. I like, I'm speechless, but, um, that's like one of those things when you're living paycheck to paycheck and when you need help, it's such a big thing to have enough trust to ask somebody for it. Even like someone that you know so well, I think even no matter who we are, even if we're not living paycheck to paycheck, if you need help, it's like a really, like, really difficult thing to do to actually like acknowledge that enough to ask somebody because you always feel like, no, I should be able to do this or whatever. I feel like there's a lot of pressure, even sometimes we don't know where it comes from to, to handle it ourselves, especially when it comes to like our living, our living situations. So, I mean, to get to a point where you can have your team come and say I'm in a situation that's unsafe and I I need help or I need help with this electric bill or that's monumental because there has to be so much trust all the way along the line for that person to feel full comfortable enough coming to you guys for that yeah absolutely yeah I agree yeah <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I have to say too, like that, I, I've talked to people um, for the podcast I do and for work. And one of the biggest things people say for like company culture and to be in a workplace that you enjoy, um, that you call me work hard and you want to return to each day is that trust as a foundation is one of the most important things. And if it's gone, it's gone. Um, and I've had people ask, well, how do I build that or how do I get that? Um, like they can go pluck it off a shelf, <laughs> but you're showing like how you worked over time, how something, a decade long program has been supported and aided by trust. And, um, the other things that you've done to get there and build that, that's incredible. Thank you. Yeah. It's definitely something that's helped with the culture of MSNW. And I think for companies who are looking to build that trust, uh, a challenge I would give is what's your why? Why are you in business? If you're in business just to make money, I mean, okay, but that's not gonna, <laughs> that's your team. That's a hard thing. That's a hard thing to sell. I mean, money doesn't give happiness. That's not, it's, uh, it's here today, gone tomorrow. Right. And so what, what is your why that's going to be impactful to the community that you live in, to the, to the team that you employ? What, what's your why? And figuring that out to where it impacts your team and it's something that they can get behind, I think, is 
is one of the keys to building trust. And then actually, you know, obviously actually doing what you say you're going to do also builds trust. But I think the why thing is, is really important. And for us, our why is we want to take care of it for our team and then our clients. And taking care of it is really a, a huge thing that ultimately has to do with providing for our team to make sure they feel supported and can do their jobs effectively and work and have a successful home life as well. And however we can do that to be most impactful, um, we're gonna try. And other things that we're doing to work on that to be able to give them more of a holistic uh, balanced life is uh, we're looking at right now uh, MSNW University training. We've been, we've been doing this, but we're focusing more on how do we, how do we train team members for upward mobility because we know we've got a really great talent pool and there are people who have never been given the opportunity or never even been asked like what do you really want to do maybe you don't want to be a landscaper cutting lawns your your whole life maybe maybe you want to be an accountant maybe you're fantastic with numbers and if you were just given the opportunity you could be an amazing accountant, right? And so how do we support people and move them in that trajectory to, to, to get into the, the sweet spot to where they can succeed and feel like they have value, right? And so we're creating a training program. We also want, we're trying to figure out how we can come alongside people who want to get specialized training, who maybe want to go to college and get a four-year degree uh, that, that don't have, may not have the resources, you know, how can we help them with that path? And then, uh, you know, circling it back to MSNW, we need to be able to create the growth, to be able to place these people in additional positions within our company. So that's another aspect we're looking to really hone in and grow with is our, our training program for upward mobility in our company. Uh, the second thing is, which was just brought to us this summer, and I'm so excited about it is, the National Guard has a program now where they can help people get um, residency citizenship within the United States. So with our company, we e-verify because we're a government contractor. And if you're a government contractor, you have to e-verify and you have to e-verify all of your team. And that has been a little bit of a downfall in the past because there are a lot of illegal residents who have lived here their whole lives and uh, simply can't work because maybe their parents crossed the border illegally back in the day, right? At this point, there's no pathway to citizenship. They're, they're, they're stuck. So I know we have some team members who maybe their parents are illegal aliens, but because they were born in the United States, then they're, they're legal, right? So part of this National Guard program is that if you en enlist in the National Guard, it creates a pathway to citizenship for your entire family. And uh, yeah, it's, it's phenomenal. And there are no strings attached. It's, it, it like gives me shivers. I'm shivering right now because it just, it, there's nothing like it. And we've, we've had team members who have worked for the National Guard before with us. And so we know what that looks like. We know what the time commitment is, all of that. And uh, it's a great way to be able to serve your nation and also, you know, continue to have a career. And now that they're offering this new program, which I think has been around for maybe a year or two, this is something that we can bring to our team and say, you know, there aren't a lot of other pathways here, but this is something that could be really amazing for your family and would create, I mean, if you can think about the amount of stress on somebody's shoulders knowing that their parents could be scooped up by ice at any minute. I mean, I can't even imagine the burden that that must that feel like. And so it's just another way that we can bring a resource to our team that can take away some of that burden and another way we can care for them in a really holistic way. I um, adopted and part of my family um, several generations ago came from Mexico. Um, and then I just, I have lots of incredible and diverse friends who have all kinds of different backgrounds, especially just come from university. We had a lot of international students. And so it's not an easy process to become a citizen when you do it through all of the open channels from your home country. Um, 
but to think some people come because they need to come to this country. And like you said, there were generations that came illegally and didn't have like the same means as others. So no, that's incredible. I didn't realize that program existed either. So wow. Yeah, and isn't then, it cool? I want to tell everybody about it because it's amazing. I've never heard of anything like it before. And the fact that you can't, and you're protected, like once you're in the National Guard, you and your family are under this wing of protection. And so ICE can't come in at that point and do anything. So that's really the cool, that's another cool aspect of it. Cause I do think that that's a huge concern for people and why they mm -hmm. wouldn't want to do that is because of that thing in the back of their heads. So I do yeah. know, I think the army or the Navy, I know some other um, parts of the government have similar programs for individuals who are illegal aliens, like for themselves, but the National Guard is unique because it's for the whole family. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, you imagine like um, if your sibling or somebody else wasn't born on U.S. soil and that's that's really cool now are they able like if they're here and they're trying to figure out how to get their family over does that allow them to yeah, yeah that's wow. part of the whole thing mm -hmm. wow no that's really cool and I mean not only are you helping your team members become aware but you're helping them figure out how to get there too how to utilize that so and, and you know there's a question of well um I think with all of this with the the enabling them to go to college and complete the degrees um, and doing all of these other pathways that, well, what if I set them up for success and they leave? Um, I feel like that's a huge question in the back of people's mind, why they're afraid to encourage their employees to get better sometimes is that they'll go find a different opportunity and leave. So what's your response to that? I mean, I don't necessarily have a good answer for it, but I think empowering people is never wrong and it's that's a negative that's a negative mindset and that's not how I live I live in a positive mindset and you know what if we train somebody up and they're awesome and they leave and they live a big life I can't fault them on that I mean that's amazing and the fact that we paid, played a part in getting them there I mean I I think we we did our job and I I mean I think it would be, it would definitely be sad to train somebody and put all that time and energy into someone and then have them leave. But I also think maybe we didn't have the spot for them at the time that they, that they wanted or needed. And that's part of us growing enough so we can provide these positions for individuals that were growing up in our company. So if we don't have the space for them at the particular time that they're ready, then I can't fault them on finding another position. And if they choose to leave, even if the position is there, then it's the introspection of, well, what could we have done differently and what's lacking that they felt like they had to go somewhere else other than where they've been, right? And sometimes it's a, there's a non-answer, you know, sometimes they move or whatever the situation may be. But I do always think it's good to ask those questions as to the why behind mm -hmm. motivation. Yeah, and it's, there's a mind, like a mindset that I'm seeing with you as we talk and this, like, it, almost treating your employees like your customer too, like caring for them in the way that you were a customer, you're trying to meet their needs um, versus seeing them as like, uh, you know, an extension of yourself, because I feel like sometimes we're not as nice to ourselves as we could be. We're just there to get the work done. It's, it's like you were saying with the, the working till seven o'clock, you don't necessarily need to do it. You can stop earlier, get the rest and come back room or rejuvenate. Well, when we treat our employees like an extension of ourselves, sometimes we beat them up like we do ourselves to get the job done. Um, so like the way you you look at your team members and your um, your company as a whole, I feel like that has to play a huge part in um, your employee satisfaction and why people do choose to stay with you. Hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, no. I would, I would, I mean, that's, and that's where our, I mean, I'm not, I'm not having that direct communication with each team member in our company. And so it's making sure that the culture I want and exhibit 
is also being carried out by each management and administrative person in, in our organization so that the team member that's working for them has the same experience as they would if they are working directly for me. And so that's what we're trying to instill and that's what we're trying to train by. And like I said, we're not doing it perfect by any means, but we're, we're taking steps to do it better each day. And so that's what matters. Mm -hmm. Well, you have set the, the precedent at the top and you're making efforts to make sure it works all the way through. And it's not just like, it's not just in your mission statement and forgotten or something like that. It's this, like you said before, a, a continuous effort, you know, it's a work in progress to get it where you want it to be. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So what are, I guess we, we've talked a lot about like, what are the really great ways to focus on your team? Those things that are in the end going to drive up your retention and make people want to stay with you. But what are some of the things that you feel really drive people away the quickest or things that businesses should take a look at right now that could be harming their retention? Well, the number one thing is just taking bodies and putting them in positions versus making sure that they actually fit the culture of your organization and are a team member who's committed to being there long-term. If, especially on the janitorial side, if we can, if we commoditize the position, then that's what we're going to get, right? But if we actually take the time to make sure we're hiring the correct person for our organization that fits, who understands the job, understands our culture, understands and has the tools made to them to be able to be successful, then I think that's where you're going to have a benefit to the retention, a positive retention. Uh, I, yeah, it's the hiring bodies, not really caring who they are. If they've got a pulse, they're in. <laughs> that's the main thing. Uh, the other thing is, is not renegotiating contracts because I think a lot of us are living within budgets that are of last year, even, I mean, they, the, the cost of living, the cost of hiring team members has changed in the last 90 days, even dramatically. And so making sure we're going back to our customers and we're getting the cost of living increase necessary in order to be able to pay people competitively. If you don't do that, you're not going to be able to do, you're not going to be able to pay competitively. And then you're going to have that continual turnover happen because you're paying a dollar below everybody else or whatever it may be. So making sure you have the right partnerships with clients that they understand that and are willing to uh, work with you to ensure that you've got the proper personnel in place. So I think those are really the two main things is not commoditizing the position and making sure your client is not commoditizing you and making sure there are partnerships on both, on both levels. Mm -hmm. I, and with the customer thing, I've heard that in a couple avenues, but it's interesting to see it pulled into the retention of your employees as well. And that um, when you're looking at bringing new customers on, making sure that it's almost like you're bringing on a new team member. You're looking for that fit, that compatibility, and if they align with your business and there's somebody you can work with um, versus just taking the contract because it's there. Um, and you're showing that like not even to get a good customer and a lifelong retention and everything there, but also to have, so you can have that relationship for your employee's sake and that that's going to help impact your retention in a positive way too. Right. So I'm trying to think as far as what some other questions I had for you were, we've covered so much and I mean, <laughs> <laughs> it's a good thing. You know, I've worked in HR um, and I have to say, I've had like that where you're supposed to, if people meet certain requirements, you're supposed to hire them into a position. It was a call center position. Mm -hmm. um, and I remember I never liked it because if you just hired somebody, whether they were going to stay or not, we asked them, how long do you plan on staying? And somebody would say six months or three months. Oh gosh. Did they and really? They really said that and you hired them anyway? <laughs> it, uh, there was a really like our, like the people who oversaw us, like above my boss would tell us, like they'd have us ask the question, but they really didn't want us to exclude them because they answered that way. Like that wasn't a deciding question. 
Mm-hmm. And I, I get people, people get, get on me a couple of times because I would turn somebody down. I wouldn't offer somebody if they seem like, even if I could judge from the conversation, like, oh, I plan on working here for as long as possible. And they give that vague answer. Mm-hmm. And then as I'm talking to them, I can kind of tell that they just want to get in, get out of like the place as a whole. And I wouldn't offer them and they'd be like, well, they scored perfect on this assessment and they answered every other question perfectly. I was like, yeah, but they're going to be gone next week. Right. They're going to be gone the week after, you know, they're not going to be a good fit for us. And then, but then the people I did bring in, I didn't forget too much crap because the people I brought in then, um, and this was a horrible job. Like they were reading scripts on the phone and they weren't allowed to veer from the scripts. It wasn't fun. It was very... I worked in a call center too in college. It was not fun. I can <laughs> not fun. Um, no, there are people oh, who good training. Don't... It's good, you know. You're building that tenacity, and people yeah. say no to you all the time. <laughs> yeah, it's hard to find people who actually stay in a job like that. You have people who come oh, in yeah. with the best intentions, and they think they can do it, and then they sit down and they start doing it, and it's two days later, and they're like, "I can't do this." No, and it's, it's so not monotonous. like they're not. Yeah. It is, and so I, yeah, I had someone I've come high end. Used to be a teacher, constantly moving. She actually was one of our best fits for the position, but she'd come in. She'd do the shorter shifts, the four hour shifts, um, and she was a ball of energy. She actually infected like all of that energy into our row. People loved working on her shift and her row with her. Um, and I can't remember what it was, but I I could tell when I talked to her that she actually needed a position like that because she just needed something where she didn't have to think. Um, And then, yeah, others, you're like, they're going to be gone. But the people I offered tended to stay longer. um, And they, most of them, I was in internships. I was there for like eight months. Most of them were still there when I left of all the people I offered. So I never got too much crap for, for being the difficult one that didn't do as I was told. But yeah, like you can't just put bodies into a position, especially a position that's hard. Right. You know, and right. these people are living paycheck to paycheck. It's a hard job. And if you just treat it like they're just a warm body to plug and go, then they're gonna that's what you're going to get. Go. Yeah, that's what you're going to get. Yeah. So, um, and, I, you know, it's hard because I when I, I only did recruitment for a couple of years and I feel like I can never train amply until I'm extremely comfortable with something. Um, but identifying like what are those towels for somebody who just wants to come in and get out they just need to fill their paycheck like their wallet until they can get a different job um, versus somebody who is coming in and just kind of needs this pace right now who's this is where they're ready for and what they need um, or that it's you know sometimes it's not always like the the verbal signs sometimes it's their body language in the interview or things like that like they don't want to be there and you can tell um so it's it goes back like mm-hmm. it resonate with that deeply um but also I wouldn't want to work for anybody who dreams treated me like a number they could plug in and go like right I love to be challenged I love to see what I can do and while everybody might not be the same I appreciate when somebody supports those things that make me passionate so mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And that's why having communication with your superior is so important just to make sure that you guys are on the same page and you're mm-hmm. feeling cared for, getting your needs met, right? Yep. My favorite boss I had would pull me in, uh, pull our team in because we were very like-minded people, um, very driven. She'd show us things outside of our responsibilities that we might later do in our in a different job and she would teach us about it how she does things she would teach us the like off the record things like they come in like this and you're supposed to file them like this uh, but you kind of know how it's going to go based on blah 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 blah. Um, Mm -hmm. so it was interesting I liked that because like I like learning I like thriving Um, so no it, it goes a long way it doesn't matter what position you are in you like that support so Exactly. What are, is there, I guess for me, is there anything else that you would like to add um, or note for companies when it comes to uh, caring for your employees and ultimately increasing your retention, like that you would like to tell our listeners? 
I think it's really important to sit down with your team and identify who, what the personality of your brand is, who are you, uh, what, is, what does that mean when you're hiring people, what, what is the ideal team member look like, and, uh, and really just be aligned in that vision, because that's how you're going to be able to identify who the correct people are to come in and be a part of your team. And then it's accountability. It's making sure that your management team who's responsible for the frontline staff is meeting with them on a regular basis, that they, they are doing the training that they're supposed to be doing, that they're giving the reviews, the 90-day reviews, uh, that there is a regular check-in that's happening and that you as a manager are making sure that those supervisors are having that check-in and whatever that may look like, whether it's an Excel spreadsheet or if it's just like forwarding uh, a text string on so we know we know what's happening. Uh, I don't know. You have to do whatever works best for you. But I just think having those checks and balances, having the accountability, putting goals around it, making it fun. Uh, I Whatever you do, make it fun, right? If you're going to have a competition, what what empowers your people? What gets what's what's exciting to them? You know, is it a hundred dollars or is it a bowling or going golfing or whatever it may be? So I I think competitions are always a great way to get every the team involved and on the same page and uh, looking at best practices of the people within your organization are who are doing it better. So doing trend reports and really analyzing the data so you know where to start and. If you have somebody on the team who's doing it very well, then it's a train the trainer kind of situation, mimicking it, mimicking what's work, what's working. So that's that's my tidbit, my advice that I have. <laughs> it's never going to be perfect, but you have to continually be looking at it and making improvements and striving for, um, you know, asking the questions, pulling your team, pulling your entire team as a as a whole, and asking them for feedback it's uncomfortable to do and some answers you may not like, but it's showing them that you actually care. So getting that feedback and then doing something about it, not just getting it and seeing it and then letting it lie, but actually taking it and putting actions behind it. And that's what you can really build with your management team is, okay, this is our feedback. What are we going to do different? And then building those competitions, that fun thing off of that. So there you go. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, Terrell. I want to thank you for coming on and joining us on the show. I've really liked this episode and I think it comes at a great time. Um, and then, you know, just also give me your, me your time. I know you guys are really busy over on your side. Um, so thank you again for joining us. Of course. Thanks for having me. It's been very fun. Of course. Thank you for coming on. And then to everybody who's tuned in this month so far, thank you for listening. I'll be typing up a blog post on what we just covered that coordinates with it very well. We'll also have a transcription. So if you missed something, you can go back and listen again, or you can read it. It's up to you. And then if you guys want to reach out, feel free to reach out. We can answer any additional questions that you have. Thank you.